as far as I'm concerned, meditation is prayer. They're the same thing. You may, in prayer, you may be actually talking to yourself because uh, the understand, if, if, you, if you're clear about who you are and you're clear about the truth, uh, why, why pray to some far away God, you know? Because if you understand the truth and you understand these practices, um, God's where you are. God's nowhere else but where you are. And that's what it says in the Bible. Uh, you know, omnipresent, right? What is the omnipresent, omniscient, you know, everywhere? So that, then, then it becomes interesting, you know, to, because if, if your true nature is, is, to, is your Buddha nature, or if you want to talk about it in Christian terms, your Christ nature, same thing, right? If that's the case, then the things get interesting because um, your personality is a, a, a displaced aspect of God. It's a displaced aspect of God, you know, that had to uh, take form the way it did and had to forget its true nature the way it did in order to make this happen. This, this couldn't happen without that. You know, if everybody knew the truth, the game would be over, right? Uh, so if you, if you wake up and you realize your true nature, whether you consider it Buddha nature or Christ nature or Tao nature or whatever, nature, dog nature or something, uh, then it gets interesting because you, you are then put in a position to practice um, being aware of that consistently. Otherwise, the displaced aspect of yourself uh, will continue to operate and it will produce negative consequences because it's so uh, limited and, and so unlike the tr your true nature. Its, its existence is, is bound by a brain that is programmed to survive. And that's as it should be, you know, because in, in, in this realm, in this world, in this space-time reality, uh, and in this game that we're playing, in which you and I are separate from one another and separate from the rest of humanity and separate from you know, the world, uh, survival has to be the most important program running in your brain. Under those conditions, it has to be. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be around very long. But when you wake up, if, as you start to wake up, you don't disregard the survival programming but you understand that survival program uh, is in existence for the survival of the physical body and the survival of who you thought you were. But now you're aware that you're not who you thought you were and you're not the physical body. And so the survival program is, is um, it's, it's seen differently and it's related to different, it's experienced differently. One way that it's experienced differently is that the survival of the physical body, you, that, that aspect of the program, you leave it alone if you're smart. You, know, you don't want to mess with that, right? But, but that's a very limited aspect of the survival program in your brain. I mean, how many times a day is somebody threatening your life? You know, especially now. This isn't, you know, the Stone Age. So, uh, so that's a very limited aspect of the survival programming. The majority of the survival program is, is to have you survive as something that doesn't exist. And that's where the game gets interesting because when you, when you come to know your true nature, you know that your true nature doesn't need a survival program. Your true nature can't be killed, can't be hurt, can't be affected at all by anything. Right? This is the beauty and the wonder of the truth, you know, that um, at, at all times, wherever you are, this is, this is, the, this is the, uh, the promise, this is the possibility. At all times, wherever you are, there is a possibility of recognizing and realizing the truth of who you are, your true nature. At all times, wherever you are. So if you come to know your Buddha nature or your Christ nature, then that game is on in terms of practicing, paying attention, so the programming that was running the show starts to lose its operation right because now if something comes if something threatens your personality right 
if you're awake, this is walking the path. If you're awake and something threatens your personality, right, you just smile. Because that, 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 that there's your personality, it, it doesn't exist. You know, so, so, and if you get upset about it, if you get angry about it, if you get hurt about it, that's just information that you should take in as information that you're still in your survival mode, that you're still uh, being a personality about it. And that's why that's the case. Otherwise, so the practice is a practice where uh, you, you want to the, consistently be paying attention to whether you're in the personality mode or in, in the mode of, the true, of your true nature. That's what I was talking about earlier. You know, I, you know, when I was riding around today in the rain and the traffic and crowded in the supermarket and this, that, and the other thing, you know, but the typical way of relating to that for most people is, oh, it's terrible. It's terrible because it's raining. It's terrible because there's a lot of traffic. It's terrible because the stores are crowded. It's terrible, it's terrible, right? Why would you want to live, if, if it was possible not to live in that experience, why would you want to continue to live in that experience? You know, why would, that's, you know, so that, that's what I, you know, so all those things were there today, right? And there's enough, there is enough, uh, uh, residual reality of my personality to be aware that that's you know that's the kind that's the way it would if that's the way it would play if I was just being a person right? but uh, I, I have enough of a connection to my true nature that even though those uh, those uh, th there that there's there's residual stuff there about the personality where I could see how people would be relating to what's going on um, for me I was having fun why not you know, why not? I'm just having fun with it. You know, there was no re there's no reason not to have fun with it, you know, to just be playful. That's, you know, that's what happens if you, if you, start, to, uh, if you start to realize your true nature, not just know about it, not just think about it, you know, but actually realize your true nature. What starts to become apparent is your life is an opportunity to have fun. Why not? You know, it's like, it's like, like, they, like they say to the Dalai Lama, with all the suffering and craziness in the world, why do you keep smiling? And he said, because I can. <laughs> why not? You know, how can, I, how can I model the possibility for other human beings? How can I be a bodhisattva if, uh, if all I'm doing is behaving the way they are? If all I'm doing is, is, is agreeing with them that everything sucks and then you die. If I'm agreeing with them that, you know, oh, it was a terrible day today because it was raining or it was a terrible day because there were more cars on the road, it was a terrible day because there, were, there was a lot of people in the supermarket. That's crazy talk. You know, if you're awake, that's crazy talk. And yet, as crazy talk as it is, if you listen to people, if you listen to people, that's the conversation. It's a conversation for, it's a conversation for what's wrong, isn't it? It's always a conversation for what's wrong. You know, so that's what you're trying, that, that's what you're paying attention to not feeding into, that's what you're paying attention to not identif identifying with, and that's what you're practicing not being uh, uh, related to anymore, so that you can have some fun. You know, Paul Reps is a, was a Zen teacher, and um, he used to say, if it's not fun, it's better left undone. When I first heard that, I thought, oh, that's strange, you know, the, there are a lot of things I won't be able to do now. <laughs> but he didn't mean it that way. He meant you should be having fun all the time. You know, not, not only do the things that you think will give you an experience of having fun, no, but why aren't you having fun all the time? The personality, see look, the personality thinks, oh, I get it, I'm gonna learn about this and then I'm gonna practice being that way. That's what this is, I'm gonna practice being that way. I'll be an improved personality. I'll be a more accepting person. And if I'm a more accepting person, then I'll be happier. <coughs> So that's what that's, so I really have to like practice acceptance, pra practice acceptance. No, no, this is not about being a better personality. It won't work to practice acceptance because if you're practicing acceptance along with practicing acceptance, you're practicing the possibility of rejection and you're practicing the possibility of resistance because acceptance is one side of the coin, isn't it? 
Yeah, so as long as you're practicing acceptance, that not practicing acceptance exists. As long as you're practicing acceptance, not being accepting exists, and you'll fall into it for sure. So, no, acceptance is your, your Buddha nature, right? Your Buddha nature can't, doesn't accept or reject. It doesn't accept or reject. Your Christ nature doesn't accept or reject. It just is. You get the difference between that? It's not practice. Your, your Buddha nature, your Christ nature isn't practicing anything. It doesn't have to practice anything. Because it's, it, the, the, the way it is being in the world is transcendental. It's transcendental wisdom. The way it's being in the world transcends the idea that you have to practice anything. It appears, it, it appears as acceptance to other people, other personalities. That's their interpretation of it as acceptance, and they want to be more like you. As, you know, they want to be a better person. You know, it's, it's a, you know, the personality game is an improvement project, isn't it? The personality game is how, how good can I get at being a person? You know, how, how, what, what are the things that I should practice to be a person? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's not a good idea to be a better person. No, there, there are such things as better people and not so good people, right? I'm, so I'm, I don't have anything against any of that, and I think people should be as good a person as you can be, right? But this is not about that. This is about, it's just like conventional psychology is about improving the personality, getting the personality to be more functional, you know, less conflict, all that jazz, a better communicator, right? But the, the, the way that I practice psychology these days is no longer conventional. I'm not interested in helping people be a better personality. I'm interested in people discovering that they're not a personality. To transcend the whole thing, transcend the whole project, throw the whole project out, you know, and start paying attention to the possibility that who you are is already fulfilled. Who you are is love. <coughs> See, who you are is love. You're not trying to get better at loving. You're not trying to be more loving. No, who you are is love. Can you look through the eyes of love? Can that be the view that you have? When you're with your relatives on Thanksgiving, can you, can you, be, can you have the view be that you're looking through the eyes of love at them and seeing what you see when you look at them through the eyes of love? If you look at them through the eyes of love, you're, you will be seeing yourself in another version, right? And the version that you may be seeing yourself in is a version of people who are still blind or still totally unawake, you know, still just doing the best they can as a personality, right? I mean, when people get around the table at Thanksgiving, right, it's an interesting thing to observe, right? There's a lot of non sequiturs that go on. Do you know what non sequiturs are? A lot of non-judge, watch, watch, you'll see it, non sequitur. Because the personality, when it's in the company of other personalities, it's got to do something to make itself valid. It's got to act, it's got to do something to make itself important. It's got to do something to make it, make an appearance, you know, show up. It's got to show up at the table, right? So you got to think about, what, what could I say that would have me look good? What could I say that would show that I have the right view politically? What could I say that would show people how smart I am, right? That's, the, that's how the mind shows up in a social situation, right? Yeah. So, you know, so just, just notice it, and, and, and when you're noticing it, you know, notice where you're at about it, because if you're a practitioner, it means that you're not going to sit there and be pure love. That's what I meant when an opportunity to practice, you know, you're not going to sit there and be pure love. You're going to sit there, and it's a situation, especially if it's your family, right? You have a lot of... Uh, neural connections to these people. You have a lot of neural patterns related to these people, so a lot of shit's going to go off when you get together, right? You get together with your parents and shit's going to go off. You get together with your siblings and shit's going to go off. So the name of the game is, can I, can, can I control the shit that goes off with me and, 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 and be a good social critter here, you know? Get a few laughs, right? And, and keep my mouth shut when it comes to what I really feel like saying. <laughs> Yeah, that's what happens, right? And when you look at it, it's not something that you have to say, oh, it's terrible. No, it's not really terrible. These people are just doing the best they can, right? 
And so you want to have a, it be a situation where you're practicing being, walking the path. It's just like David Radin said, when somebody that is, was one of the people of that kind of the community of the center, the Zen center, and they came up to him and said that they just got a diagnosis of cancer. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And they said, oh, shit. Yeah. And he looked at them and he said, how long have you been practicing this? How long have you been walking the path and it's all shit? That's the way you have to look at all this, is, you know, is, is, is as things are occurring, can you be paying attention consistently enough to see, see what, hap what your mind's doing, right, but not have that be you? See what your mind's doing, but not have that be you. It's okay that your mind does that, you know, it's, the mind, it's just a machine, it's just a computer that's plant, you know, running a program, right? But when it runs that program, if you, if you automatically and unwittingly re identify with it and, and have that mind be what you are, that, see, that's, that's what I mean when I say there is no gap between people's minds and their mouth. There's, there's no gap. Uh, yeah, it's okay that your mind says, oh shit, but you're not your mind. And for you to say it as if your mind is, an ind is demonstrating that you're really not doing, you're not walking this walk, you know? It doesn't make you a bad person, but you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. And if that's the case, it's an opportunity for you to realize that, you know, the situation that occurred when you got that diagnosis was a situation that, that allowed you to see where you were at. And you were, were not, you were not free yet from, you know, the reactions that your mind brings up and the, and the reactions that your mind has. When I got my diagnosis, I mean, I got it, I, it turned out it wasn't really uh, super terminal, right? I mean, it's all terminal eventually. <laughs> it wasn't that it was super terminal, but when I got a diagnosis that was a fairly serious diagnosis, right? My honest response to it was, oh, hmm, that's interesting. And I didn't know, I, hadn't, I didn't even ask the, 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 the doctor about the details, you know? It just, t the, the way I related to it was, okay, yeah, I got it. Because I really do understand that predetermination is the truth. And if that's the case and you get a, uh, you get a diagnosis, it's like, okay, that's interesting. That's what's going to happen next. That's all. That's all. And because predetermination is the truth, you realize there's no point worrying about it. You're, you know, everybody in this room's death has already occurred. So what, what are you worried about? It's already occurred. You might as well enjoy yourself, right? Because there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to happen when it's going to happen, and it's already happened. So to be concerned and worried about it is, you know, it's just a waste of energy. You know, it's a, life is too precious and valuable to be wasted on worrying about things that haven't happened yet and may never happen. It's too valuable. It's too precious. You know, if you wake up in the morning and, uh, and you don't give yourself the opportunity to take a few moments to clear, to clear your head, you know, because... You know, when you wake up in the morning, what wakes up is the person. What wakes up is the mind, right? What wakes up in the morning is the voice in your head that starts to run, right? And it's a good idea in the morning to just stop before you get out of bed. Just sit on the side of the bed and let yourself see that the program is running now. And is this day going to be a day that, that's determined by this program? Or is this day going to be a day that's determined by the possibility? The possibility is always here for me to experience fulfillment, satisfaction, peace of mind, and happiness. It's always here. It's always here. So that's the game. That's the game. That's the path you're walking on. That's the game you're playing. Paying attention so that you can see when the mental activity is trying to keep you in a survival mode and keep you out of having any fun. So you can see it. And, and if you're practicing watching it so you can see it, when it does that, you just notice it, you acknowledge it, right? But you don't identify with it. You don't, I, I, this is something I can't emphasize enough because sometimes I lose a sense of how true it is. And I remember, you know, when I think back in my own life, I remember, the, I remember what it was like to not know the difference between my mind and me. I remember it, you know, when I thought that, when I thought that what I thought was true, what, when I thought what, what, how I felt about things was valid and how I thought about things was true and that's how I led my life and that's how I spoke and that's how I acted, right? 
and there was a lot of suffering going on, right? Right, because that doesn't work. It's dysfunctional. It's a dysfunctional way of living, right? I can remember it. I can remember it. And so sometimes I forget about it, and, and it's very important to, to emphasize the fact that the thing that has to happen for you to break free, the thing that has, has to happen for you to, you know, to, to be on the path and start to walk the path, right, is you have to get clear about the fact that this voice in your head, there's an insidious ongoing situation here. There's an insidious ongoing situation here in which whatever is going on in the environment, whatever circumstances you're encountering, you know, the weather, the, the traffic, what's going on in your body, what's going on in your relationships with your family, you know, what's going on in your career, what's going on with your money, all those circumstantial realities, right, uh, are now stimulating your brain and your mind, right, to, to, to protect yourself, to be safe, you know, to avoid, you know, to avoid, uh, Get, get being hurt to avoid losing my money to avoid you know letting my relationship get out of control i gotta keep control i gotta stay in charge you know all of that right if you're paying attention consistently what you want to do is get right down to the nitty-gritty of recognizing and understanding that that voice in your head the thoughts that it's producing the thoughts that it's producing are not thoughts that are in your best interest most of the time. And so if you're paying attention to that, you start realizing that, wait a minute, uh, if I'm paying attention to that, especially when the thoughts get connected to emotions, right? When thoughts, get, when thoughts and angry emotions get together, right? It's a formula for disaster. Because, you know, you, 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 you totally identify, you know, when you're really angry, when you're like enraged, right? You are the rage. You're literally the rage. The rage is what's saying what you're saying, right? They're, they're, the personality isn't even there. The personality shrinks down into just being an emotion. That's what happens. And that's a dangerous situation because when that's the case, right? When that's the case, the people around you don't have to do much, right? They don't because you're on high alert. You're, you know, you're on high alert now. Anybody around you that missteps, right? You know, you shoot right away. You got your hand on the trigger right away. Anybody that missteps around me, you shoot right away. Why? Because you don't have the time to be patient. You don't have the time to be patient. You don't have the time to have compassion. You have to survive. You have to survive this situation that's happening right now. And that's how it feels. And when you calm down and you look back at, at how you behaved, it goes one of two ways. You look back and you're usually embarrassed and ashamed, right? Or you dig in and say, I was absolutely right, fuck them. <laughs> right? It goes one of two ways. <laughs> they're, the two, they're, the two, they're the two possibilities for the mind, right? You know, is it either I'm ashamed of myself or I don't give a shit. So transcendental wisdom means that you now know that who you really are can only show up and express itself if you're paying attention to the mind trying to run the program of who you're not. Paying attention to the mind trying to run the program that will have you be uh, stressed out, uptight, you know, impatient, intolerant, demanding, insisting. And when you're connected, when you're directly connected to that programming and it's using your mouth, right? It just, you, you can, you, if, you're, if you practiced at it, you, know, you can actually hear the mind talk. That's what's happening. You're hearing the mind talk. You're not hearing the self talk. The self, first of all, the self has much less to say than the mind. The self is a lot quieter than the mind. You know, it's enjoy silence. You know, it's like David Radin said, once you, once you experience your true nature and you experience the experience of being still and silent and experiencing your true nature, there is nothing that you could do in the world as an activity that would be anywhere near as fulfilling as that experience. Earlier, I don't have anything against being a better person and practicing being a good person. I think that's good, I think that's important. But there's something beyond that that we're talking about here. Transcendental wisdom is beyond being a good person. The transcendental wisdom is being God. Trans transcendental wisdom, you know, Douglas Harding used to say, if you want to know God, if you want to really know God, be God. 
because you are. And that's not blasphemy. That's not blasphemy. It's just saying that, you know, the consciousness that you are is the consciousness that is the source of the universe. The consciousness that you are is the consciousness that's, a, that's the source of the universe. It's not separate from anything. It's not a guy with a beard up in a cloud, you know? It's spread out among all, it's spread, it's, it's spread out into all that exists. It's spread out into all that exists. And you are that. That's what you are. Because if you say you can never know the, God, the mind of God and what you think that means is the way you know other things, that's not what it means. You, can't de it's, well, you can never know the mind of God because the mind of God is, is, is incomprehensible. It's non-conceptual. That's what that means. We know that, that God isn't a guy with a beard doing anything. We know that the, the, the system, the, the way God is as a system, right, is a cause and effect reality. That's why we're talking about predetermination. That we know how we know how we know why God how God does things. It's a cause and effect reality. If you want to know, you know what what God's doing, pay attention to what's happening, and then notice what happens next, and see that what happens next came from what happened before. So the thing that's interesting about that is, is if it's if it's true that you are God, you can't even comprehend your own nature. And you can't. You can't. You don't. You don't know. You know the awareness that you're experiencing right now is a mystery to you, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know what it is? No, that's incomprehensible. That's the mind of God.